Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. My name is Dave, and I'm like, I'm like blown out here. This, I mean, like, this guy is a fucking good guest. He is a a ridiculously legendary punk rock drummer. You might know him as Eric Gint, Erection, Groggy Nod, Beggar, Chris Talmeth, Herb Reth Stinks. Seymour Butts, or maybe you know him as Smelly, or maybe you know him as Eric Sandin. Maybe you know him as who Courtney Love said the worst junkie in history was. But here he is, Eric Sandin, also known as Smelly from No Effects. Welcome to the show. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. I'm just chilling in bed with my doggy. Nice. We yeah, just you know, our- I'm, I'm maybe sober, but that doesn't mean I'm not into bestiality. Well, you're not the only one, right? Um, right. So I'm, you know, I, 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 to be totally honest with you, I wasn't a big No Effects listener. Uh, I cannot believe how good your book is. It's fucking insanity. Like it's one of my favorite books I think I ever read, and I've been listening to No Effects since I read the book, and I feel like I missed out on half my life. It's awesome. It, you didn't miss out on shit, dude. We're a mediocre band at best with a couple good songs. Most of it's just kind of dog shit, in my opinion. Well, it's a good spirit. You know, I feel like I missed out on punk rock in that I didn't get to belong. Like something you talk about a lot in the book, and I've heard you talk about on other interviews, is this craving for acceptance that you found in the punk rock scene. And I think I craved acceptance and I was too scared to be in the punk rock scene. You know what I'm saying? Like I was in the ska scene in New York city in the early nineties, but I was like scared of the skinheads. Like I was like, I was in the scene, but not in the scene. And I, I just, I, huh? You were in the safe zone. Like you were like, everybody just have a good time and dance around like, like, like little jack offs. Yeah. I was in the safe zone. Absolutely. Um, I craved I craved the excitement and the crazy zone uh, because my my life was chaotic as a child and and that was just one of those things like yeah I just craved it right but it also it came with a community it came with like a scene and you were like I can do this well absolutely it came with a community it was a bunch of bunch of kids probably that felt the same way I felt outcasts insecure just wanting to belong to something and we just became like our own little tribe you know it probably was the the healthiest tribe but it was a tribe absolutely and one thing we do have in common is we're horrible drug addicts and heroin addicts and uh even though i was in the stay safe jerk off scene i think you called me a second ago but we had a we had a I, we both kind of love to medicate ourselves with substances to feel comfortable. Um, and your fucking history is, uh, is deep. Um, when's the first time you got high? On uh, which substance? First substance, first high, first altering of the old noggin. Eight years old, probably. And? Uh, I remember I was at uh, my uncle's house. I kind of grew up in a, in a white trash environment and I was at my uncle's house and he was drinking beer and I said, let me have a beer. And he gave me a beer. And I remember drinking it. I probably drank half the beer, but I got fucking buzzed at eight years old. I remember it distinctly. Was that the same, was that the same uncle that wound up selling bud and all that stuff? No, a different uncle. Wow. So both sides, both sides, there were options. Um, yeah, no, I, it was the same side of the family, just another uncle. All right. And, uh, and, and they were selling you, your other aunt and uncle were selling weed and acid or just weed, weed, Coke, Quaaludes. And they, wow. and we literally right, right next door. Like we, you know, our, our house ended there started and they were, were bikers. He was the president of a big, big 1% biker gang that's pretty fucking prevalent. And it's kind of what it was, you know? And, you know, I, I remember feds raiding them. I remember uh, just, you know, just a bunch of shit. 
when's the first time you you went there and and, and was weed the first thing between weed quaaludes and coke or did you do something before the bus no weed was the first time i remember the first time i saw weed and i remember and i knew what it was i was probably probably seven and i went went to their house and i saw a big like tin foil like uh, what you cook a turkey in you know and I think they were probably just cleaning out the seeds and stuff like that. And I saw it and I saw the rolling papers and a roach clip. And I'm like, I think I know what that is. And that was my first. See, I'd seen people smoke it, but that was my first time seeing it. And um, yeah. And then so, yeah, weed was the first thing, the first drug that I tried. Who'd you smoke with the first time? Myself, by myself. You rolled your own joint? Like, did you steal a joint? Did you steal a bowl? What did you do? <laughs> no, no, the first time the first time I smoked weed, I was probably 11 or 12. Uh, my dad, we had a trailer on the side of the yard where a couple of his buddies were living. And uh, it's kind of a gross story. Nice. Not this story, but what happened in the trailer later. Um, my dad had a trailer where a couple of his buddies were living and uh, they were, I don't know, they stayed with us for like six or nine months or something like, you know, one of those guys, one of those things like, hey, can we come stay at your house for two weeks and it turns into like, you know, nine months or something. So, you know, they'd smoke weed all the time and, and I could smell it. And so, so I went in there one time, one day and no one was in there and there was a bong with it loaded up. And I, I'm a fucking such a dummy though. I wasn't quite sure how to do it the first time. So I sucked on the bowl. Yes. And all, <laughs> and all of the ash went up into my mouth. I feel and like then I, got, I figured, yeah. 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 And then I figured it out. And you got, and like, when did you realize you liked it? Like, when did you realize like, oh shit, this might be for me? You know, it's really weird. Like weed, for me, weed, like it, it wasn't ever really my thing. Like I did it fucking a lot, but it was never really my thing. But okay. So, so fast forward a couple years or a year or so, I'm in junior high. I have access to as much weed as anybody could ever want because of my aunt and uncle. So I start, and I wanted to be accepted by the cool tough kids, right? Because I just felt insecure and I didn't belong anywhere and, and I was always getting in trouble at home. So if I'm with the fucking, you know, I was always being told what a shithead I was. So why not go hang out with fucking shitheads, right? So I started stealing weed from my aunt and uncle, you know, by the, by the handful, like, you know, probably, I don't know, once or twice a week, like a good fucking handful of, of really good bud. And I was uh, 13 years old, I don't know, seventh grade, 12, 13 years old, selling it, you know? And so I quickly started kind of becoming accepted, accepted and the cool guy. I mean, I wasn't right. the cool guy, but accepted by what I thought was the cool guys. And you had the thing that the cool guys valued and all of a sudden you're, you're part of it. And your dad, like, I love reading about like your family, your dad and your daughter and, and kind of the story of your family. But I loved hearing about how much your dad loved music. How, when did music and drugs or music and pot connect for you? Like when was the first time that happened? Oh, fuck dude! It was, I know it was always, hand in hand from growing up listening to my dad's like fucking sixties rock and, and, and all of that shit and his friends coming over and, you know, putting on, putting on music and drinking beers and smoking weed. Like, you know, like seeing, seeing them smoke weed from a distance and stuff. I knew it was always connected, you know, and, and like the Beatles singing, I get high with a little help from my friends and, you know, Rolling Stones, mother, you know, I just, I just knew it was together. And then also the fact that every motherfucker when I was a kid was overdosing, you know, like, you know, like all those Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and, you know, all the, they were, you know, it, it was always a known fact that drugs and rock and roll went together. And my dad is a huge rock and roll guy. Right. And there was like, and again, it was danger. You like the tough guys. So the danger of rock and roll, the death Danger in death, but also danger in the coolness of the scene, like Jimi Hendrix and all those people. You can't get much cooler than that, right? Right. There was just like this this volatility, this angst, this this set of un, uneasiness. You don't know what you're going to get. And that attracted me to rock and roll. And then that's also what really attracted me to punk rock. Is like all of a sudden rock and roll was this safe thing now, this accepted thing. 
And punk rock was like, whoa, you know, and, and it, it fucking scared me, but it was intriguing at the same time. And your dad was a plumber, middle class plumber, great sound system, loved listening to Led Zeppelin and stuff. So it's yeah. like, it's like it can't get more middle class than that in a way. So it's like you love the music, but then you're like, I can't be into what my dad is into. And then where's the first time you heard punk rock? First time I ever heard punk rock ever was probably in 1977. Um, I was maybe 78. I was driving in a car with another uncle and the Ramones song, Beat on the Brat. Yeah. And the song says, Beat on the Brat with a baseball bat. You know, and so I, at that point, I'm like 12 years old or something. I'm like, holy fuck. This guy's talking about beating a fucking kid with a baseball bat. This is gnarly. This is fucking insane. And it just, it hooked me. Like, that was like just, just how, fuck, I don't know what the word would be, but just how like, it just hooked me. It was intriguing. It was like, this is not fucking normal shit. And I liked it. And it was also so catchy. And the Ramones also was a weird punk rock band with two Jews. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. I think not. So it catches your ear. You fucking you. I, I remember you. You tried to play guitar, and, and you and you're, you're playing. I, I remember from hearing you talk about it, you're playing some fucking folk music and 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 shit. You weren't that interested. How did the the drums happen? Well, the drums happened. Okay, so I heard the Ramones, and I don't know. Let's let's just say seventy seven, seventy eight, right? Punk rock was on my radar, but I didn't really know what it, what it is, what it was. It was just weird. You know, it's just this fucking scary shit. And I saw some stuff on TV, like the Tubes singing White Punks on Dope, which is a fucking phenomenal song. You heard that song? Yes. It's a phenomenal... And I saw them doing that live, and they had fucking just... It was just, you know, it was punk rock on stage. Uh, so fast forward a couple years after that... I have now gotten into punk rock. I've been introduced to it properly by some older kids and, 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 um, they, one guy knew how to play guitar. One guy kind of knew, how, you know, we're all, I, I was 14 at the time or something like that. They, these guys are like 17. They kind of knew how to play instruments and they're like, Hey, we need a drummer. You're going to be the drummer. And I'm like, okay. And so I went and bought a cheap shitty drum set for 200 bucks and, Fuck, after our first practice, I knew a song. I actually knew how to play drums after one practice. What was the song? It was uh, a song from a band called Red Cross, and it was actually two songs. Muscle Beach Party and uh, – no, no, no. Yeah, Muscle Beach Party. Uh, not, yeah, Muscle Beach Party and um, uh, uh, what's, I think the song's called Whip, Whips and Chains or – oh, no, S&M Party, S&M Party. Wow, that's another. It's really easy. Good, it's like, it, it's it a good precursor, dun, 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 dun. though. S and M party to to know. Fuck, parts. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, but this. I mean, I guess it makes sense. The first, the first lyrics are, "I've had enough of these whips and chains." You know, I've had enough of hearing Mike fucking talk about that shit for thirty years. I can imagine. Um, yeah, it's like, like, okay, dude, I get it. We all get it. Not all of our merchandise has to have it on it. Not all of our record covers has to have on it. You don't need to talk about it with everybody. We know. Well, you, it's some things like people, they need to keep waving the, they need to wave the flag. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm sure I do the same shit with Dopey in some kind of way or another. I was talking about punk rock with my friend just now, like kind of tracing the lineage of like how you start you know, you, I mean, where, I mean, where do you say punk rock starts? Like the Stooges, Velvet Underground? Where do you say no, punk rock I'm going to say the very first, I mean, I, people are going to debate me on this, but I, I say the very first defined punk record, like this is punk rock, is the Stooges' raw power. Right. That, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and that, I'm that not, song, huh? You know that song, I Gotta Write? Sing it to me. Uh, da 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 Oh, fuck. Yeah, right. uh, 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 yeah, right. I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> it, he's just saying, like, I got a right to do whatever I want, and you can't tell me what to do, you know? Um, it, it's fucking punk rock tempo. It's punk rock guitar chords. I don't listen to lyrics, really. I listen to the music. The but group. anyways. Yeah, I hear it. Yeah, that, that is the first 
punk rock song to me. And the spirit is the punk rock. And the thing about punk rock that's most interesting is how, like, I wasn't a punker like you were or are. Like, I, I kind of appreciated it here and there. But the coolest thing about punk rock is that it's different all over the place. It's not one thing. It's, it's a million things. And the most important thing it is is that attitude. And um, the Stooges, though, had that fucking junkie, I don't give a fuck built yes. into it. Um, yes. And, and you had that junkie, I don't give a fuck built into you. And uh, when does that like become more pronounced for you? And, and, and was the first band that you play with, was that Caustic Cause you're talking about? No, it, it was, was a band before. Caustic that. Cause. Yeah, it was pre Costa Cause. It was a band before that called the Acid Tommy Experience. Yes, yes. Well, did you yes, did you would. did you take Acid and watch Tommy? <laughs> I never did. But how fucked up is this? My mom took me to go see Tommy like when it came out. I was like ten years old. Scared the fuck out of me that Acid Queen scene. The whole movie is very very scary movie. It's, very corny dude, and scary the, movie. Yes. The uncle fucking molesting him was fucking Horrible. creepy as shit. Poor Pete Townsend, man. He's been through it. He, he he's yeah, waving he a flag has. like Fat Mike, though. I bet you they would get along really well as Pete Townsend and Fat Mike. I bet you. I bet you they would. I, well, you know, I bet you Pete would get sick of Mike talking about S and M, though. Right, right, right. That's interesting. I I would I would love to talk to Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend is just like. He's a misunderstood person, but there's just something I, I love about Pete Townsend. He's such an arrogant fuck. And well, um, here, wait, here's here's a little useless fact of information. The Who is my all time favorite rock and roll band. Tell me why. Uh, their music is emotional. It's it's there's ballads, there's in your face rock and roll. There's I don't give a fuck attitude. It's unique. Keith Moon's drumming is out of control in a good control. way, but it, it's organized chaos. Um, the songs are so fucking deep, you know, it's it, it just so it, deep. It, Pete Townsend is so fucking deep and emotional. Let me ask you this. And people always give me shit for this. I, you ever listen to the Pete Townsend demos? Like where he, he would record every who song himself and then hand the parts to Ant Whistle and Moon and Daltrey and like check out Pete Townsend scoop. And it's just him doing all the songs. I like his voice more than Daltrey's. I want to see The Who as a trio. If I could rewrite history, I'd wipe out Roger Daltrey from The Who. But that's a dick move, right? I would, but I have mental problems. I, I, uh, I never okay. liked the fringe. I never liked the hair. Like, I wasn't a fringy hair guy, you know? Yeah, that was that was the androgynous sex appeal look, you know, the the, the Robert Plant stuff. But but yeah. the who was pre Robert Plant, so maybe Robert Plant was doing the Roger Daltrey stuff. I think so. I think so. Now, when do you go full board drug addict? When does it happen to you? Well, I mean, it's it's what's full bore, you know? Like, I mean, I know what full bore is, but I mean, when I hey, hold on, is it is it full is it full bore or full board? Bore, B O R E, I think. I always know B O A R, like a fucking animal. What is it? Is it full bore or full board? I always thought it was full, like you're on on bore. What does full bore mean? Like, what's the bore in full bore? That's a good question. Maybe you're full bore, like you're a bore with the with the with the tusks just running through shit, ready to fucking rip it up as a as a bore, yeah. wild yeah. bore. So yeah, well, so okay. when when does okay, it start so, happening so, to you? So I was obsessed with drugs, like in junior high, you know, I sold them. I, I relished the attention. I liked the, the dangerous aspect of it. I liked the, um, the underground CD feel to it. I was smoking a lot of weed and I was drinking, going to high school, smoking weed kind of tapers off. I'm drinking, you know, but I'm taking a lot of acid, you know, a couple times a week, probably, you know? Throughout it, ah, you know, it ramped up from once a month to one, twice a month, whatever it is. By the time I'm at the end of high school, I'm selling acid and selling mushrooms. You know, I'm still in that lifestyle and, and, and drinking. But when I got out of high school I, at 19, I started shooting heroin. Hold on. Do I remember you know? a story in your selling acid days that you would take acid before you'd go to bed? Yes. Can you can you tell that a little bit about that, please? 
Well, I mean, I was doing acid so often and I, you know, it was such a trippy thing. And I remember one night, one night I was on mushrooms and I was, and I was trying to go to sleep and I was sitting in my room and I was just in left field and take, you know, mushrooms, like I'm in a dark, quiet room and my mind just expands out to, to the universe because there's no parameters. I'm in a, dark, a black room. So I got the bright idea to like, all right, let's do this. You know, I, I go to sleep at 11 o'clock at night. So at 11 o'clock at night, I'm going to take some acid. And when the acid kicks in at 11.45, 12 o'clock, I will have been in slumber. I fall asleep pretty fucking easy. Yeah. And uh, let's just see where it goes. And it's fucking insane. And and the acid, the trip wakes you up, right? First the dream yes, gets Yes, you weird. wake up in full bore, like climbing into the peak. You know what I mean? Right. You wake up just going like, Whoa! What you know? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different animal. How many doses are you doing at that point? A couple, probably a couple. I mean, I don't remember exactly, but but two to four was in, in the zone. And uh, so, from acid, it doesn't go acid to dope, though, right? I thought it goes. It goes. It goes acid to blow a little bit of blow, but. Okay, so so I'm only doing acid and mushrooms and like you know Valium and pills, you know, a, you know I, I'm I'm a party guy, but but not 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 like um, I mean I'm pretty out of control with my behavior, so I move out I move out when I'm 18 or 19, right out of high school. I graduated like when I was right about to be 19. I move out right away and I fall into a group of friends that are no good, no good, and. Uh, there's a lot of cocaine and heroin going around and I just wanted to be accepted. I just want to be part of these guys. I wanted to like not feel insecure. Like I'd always felt insecure in my life and, and wanted to be okay because my dad knocked it into my head that I was a fucking dummy and no one, you know, I was useless. So if, if, if people like me, I feel better about myself and, and the drugs and alcohol are a good way to shut off those insecure feelings at also a good way to bridge relationships with people that you, you know, that, are of common mindset. So I fall into these group of people and there's a lot of Coke and a lot of heroin going around. And, um, the first time I ever fucking do cocaine, the very first time I shoot it up. Yes. Crazy. The second, and, and this, the is, second, this is when you're, wait, this is when you were in Santa Barbara. Yeah. I, I think I was like 18 or 19. Yeah. Yeah. I, right after I moved out of high school, I moved up to Santa Barbara with, uh, my girlfriend who she, what she got accepted to the university and I was just, there, I just followed her up. Um, so and that's I, when I you start the doing these these fucking hard drugs, though, is when you left you left L.A. and you yeah. and and you're you're a stranger in a strange land around like not in the band, fucking not really knowing what to do, and and then you stumble exactly into this, into this drug scene, right? And and so I just wanted to um, fit in and be accepted and 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 to feel like a part of something. And so I start doing really shitty things with some really shitty people. And uh, I started doing a lot of drugs, like really hard drugs and doing a lot of behaviors that a lot of really hard drug addicts do. And uh, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. But it was my path. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a better person than that. And I knew it inside. But, but I was so broken emotionally that I would pretty much have done anything for acceptance. I know that the the stories I heard, you 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 call the guy Raymond in the book, but it's like the violence around, like the violence around that scene seemed like off the charts. Even the violence around the L.A. punk scene, like are I'm like, they're they're more violent than I expected it to be for some reason. Like, t talk about that. Like, what's that about exactly? The L.A. punk scene in the early 80s, like in 82, all of a sudden started getting like all of these just violent, like criminal aspect to it and started forming all these little fucking gangs, like for right. real gang and doing real gang shit. And then they would have fucking gang fights and shootouts and you would go to a show and, and there'd be fucking 30 guys over here fighting 30 guys over there or or 10 guys stomping to death somebody else over in the corner or getting stabbed and guns. And it, it, I, as a kid, was longing for acceptance because I felt like I didn't belong. Those people 
it's the same thing. They're, they're just more of a sociopathic attitude. They found acceptance in these little gangs that then went to punk shows and did what they did, you know, and it was extremely violent and volatile. And that's part of the reason why it attracted me too, you know? Like, so it, it was like standing up in a volcano waiting for it to explode because you don't know when, but it's going to explode. And it might explode on you or on, on the guy next to you, but it's fucking, it's scary, but it's exhilarating at the same time. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that makes the book so nuts is, number one, how honest you guys are, and and number two, that, like, like you reveal things in the book that other people in the band didn't know prior to doing the book. So there's these details coming out kind of in real time as you read it that it's just, it blows your mind. And, um, and this guy, Raymond, uh, you were really attracted to him, like, or, you know, like he, yeah. you were, you were attracted to him, not sexually, but he drew you in as, as like this person to be around because he was this gigantic, super tough guy. Was he the first guy you shot the Coke with too? Coke and heroin. Yeah. Tell us about Raymond. Tell the dopey nation about this character. Well, Raymond's real name is Ryan. He's now in prison for life. He just got convicted like eight years ago uh, for uh, serial rapist, like he was a serial rapist. So when I first met him, I was 19 and he was 23. And I remember the first time I saw him, he was walking up the street and he's like six foot tall. He was probably 220 pounds, just like built like a, um, not fat at all, like just one of those like built like my a, brick shit, the, a brick shit house right his neck is as thick as his fucking neck i mean his ne ne neck is as thick as his head yeah, yeah a brick shit house like you fucking hit him with a baseball bat the baseball bat's gonna break and <laughs> yeah. he comes walking up the street and he has a big fucking tattoo on his neck and this is in 1985 and no one did and, and, and i was like who the fuck is it was scary right because i'd seen like tough guys in, where i grew up and and you know, people in and out of prison and stuff like that, and 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 a lot of bikers. But this this guy just seemed different. So then, fast forward a few months, and I start learning the lay of the land, and I found out that's Ryan, and he had just gotten out of prison for doing six or seven years. I forget. He was twenty three. He got arrested when he was like fourteen for something. He had just gotten out. Stay away from him. He's a fucking bad dude, and he just has that written on his face. So what do I do? I ended up becoming friends with them. I, you know, like, I don't know, like we just ended up like just fucking clicking. And, and as much, he's one of those guys kind of like Joe Pesci and Goodfellas, that scene where they're sitting around the dinner table and they're all laughing. And, and, uh, what's his pickle says, yeah, you're a funny guy. And then all of a sudden the mood flips. He's like, what's so fucking funny about me? Yeah. How I am seen I fucking him do funny. Yeah. Right. And, and he really puts the screws on him and fucks with them. And you're like, fuck, this dude is a fucking psychopath. That's exactly how, how, how Ryan was. Like, he could be totally cool hanging out with you, and then all of a sudden, somebody would say something or whatever, and then he would just flip on him and just turn the pressure on until the fucking person cracked or or he beat the fuck out of him, you know? And Ryan grew up in a... Hang on. Yeah? Oh, oh thank you. My son just made a, a smoothie, and he says, this is the one. Nice. What kind of smoothie? What's up? Uh, hey. How you doing? Oh, that is the one. It's not a What's sweet. In it? That's good. What's in it? Excellent. So, so Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. What kind of smoothie? What's in the smoothie? He makes smoothies every day and just throws a whole bunch of everything in it. I, I don't know. It could have bleach in there, and he could be killing me for my uh, life insurance. All right. Excellent. At least, he, at least he's ambitious. Um, so, so what what drew you to uh, to Ryan? Like what like what drew you to the unspeakable? Okay. Right. That wanting to be accepted for because that is the exact opposite how I felt on the inside. I felt like a scared little fucking kid. Right. I felt like because, like I said, I'd been. My dad is a six foot four, two hundred and twenty pound. Strong. Thank you, buddy. Strong. Um, a man's man. And he, and he always let, let me know that 
I love my dad. We're fucking really fucking tight now. But as a kid, I could do no wrong. I mean, do do no right. And uh, it was an abusive relationship. So I always felt insecure. I always felt less than. I always felt like, um, you know, I just, just felt shitty. So I was attracted to people that were what I felt like I wanted to be. So if I could be with them, maybe people would see me that way. And it would, you know, I wouldn't You're protected. look like. You're like in the yeah. eye of the hurricane. The fucking worst guy in the world is your best friend. So who the fuck can fuck with you at that point? And then in turn, people thought I was a fuck one of those guys. Right. You know? So, uh, so that was it. Like, I just wanted acceptance. I wanted to belong. I wanted, and it's so easy I wasn't smart enough for college kids, and, and I never understood that. That wasn't, like, my upbringing. Um, blue collar all the way, hardworking, all that kind of shit. So people of that and, and lower common denominator, I mean, lower um, lower people on the socioeconomic platform it was easier for me to deal with and understand and relate with. And then, so... Everything was based off of insecurities. I mean, that's that's what I've learned through life. Like, and, and from from getting clean and sober is like, all of my and I and I and I think this for everybody. Everybody with with drug addiction is just trying to suppress that inner insecurities. You know. Sure. So, anyways, so was that, let me ask you something real quick. If Fat Mike was from Beverly Hills. Was that a thing? Was that like an annoying class thing? I don't think I ever, I don't remember reading about that at all. Well, like, and, Fat Mike was from Beverly Hills, but he grew up in a tiny little one bedroom apartment. His mom right. was a manicure. So it wasn't Here's a class somewhere. thing with him. It wasn't like a, a thing. No, like that with him. no. I mean, there was times when, when I was like, oh, fucking rich kid. Oh, fucking rich kid. Because you go to Beverly Hills high. And that was, you know, 40 fucking years ago or what, 30 years ago. But now that I look back, I was like, wait a minute single mom raising a kid out, you know, like, no, they just happen to live in a, in a, in a nicer area. Yeah. That wasn't the story. I'm with you. So we're with Ryan. He's a fucking crazy person. And, uh, I wanted to ask, like, I want to get to the, the drug addiction stuff, but that story about Melvin's girlfriend and him like that, like just send chills down my spine when I read it in the book. Like I, I almost like was happy for Melvin that it didn't happen when he describes, you know, like that he, that, that his girlfriend had fought off Ryan. And I was like, okay, well that's easier for Melvin to live with. And then the next chapter, fat Mike admits that Ryan actually did rape her. And like, that's fucking like a crazy thing to, to put in the book. And that Melvin never, Melvin really never knew it until then. I think he probably was in denial, you know, right. uh, um, Ryan, Ryan, he definitely was. Ra I mean, the, uh, he went to prison right after that for twelve years for raping. You know, he's a serial rapist. He's a predator through and through. So she's not going to fight him off. Right. Impossible. Yeah. No, impossible. So when's the first time you see the coke? Do you remember? The first time I saw it, I think, was at my aunt and uncle's house next door. But you weren't interested. What 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 changed when nah. you were with Ryan? That he's doing it. Uh, acceptance, wanting to be accepted because they were shooting coke and smoking coke, and I wanted to belong. I just wanted to belong. And the same you with know? heroin. Yep. Exactly. And, and the heroin is probably six weeks after I shot the coke. And and you became like you 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 did you shoot coke incessantly like you shot heroin. Uh, for the first, you ever shoot Coke? Yeah. You know, like I wasn't one of those guys that was like every day looking to shoot Coke, but if I got myself some Coke, I would shoot it. And then that sends you down the fucking rabbit hole. Like, you know, let's I say you get I a only, I only would shoot Coke if I didn't, if I had Coke, which I never bought Coke. If there was Coke, right. I would shoot it. But I would also like, I would do any drug to make me need heroin more. So I had no excuse not to get it. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Gotcha. But yeah, Coke, uh, there was a, there was, when I was like 20, 21, I was dealing Coke. So I shot a lot of it. Yeah. 
Like I bought a, I bought a couple ounces. When I say Dealey Coke, I dealt Coke for a month. You know, when I was younger, I I had dealt a little here and there, like a little twenty bucks here, a little twenty bucks there. But you know, when I was like twenty or twenty one, I bought a, a couple ounces and you know sold it for a month. And but I would shoot Coke two nights a week, three nights a week, you know, and stay up till seven in the morning until I you can't think straight. There's no more fucking veins left, and you just I gotta sleep, and then you just fall asleep. And heroin? Uh, not at the time. I've only done. I only did speedballs a couple times, but I mean, I was doing heroin at the time, but not at the same time. But heroin became a total lifestyle. Yes. Coke was just like, let's fucking party. Heroin became, I became a bona fide real junkie. You know, it started off, it started off with you shooting with Ryan, you know, and like, you know, a couple times a week, whatever, cool. Then I would cop it on my own every now and again. And then six months later, eight months later, I'm like, holy fuck. I think I'm strung out. I, you know, the first time I realized I was dope sick, I went home for a Christmas vacation. I went home and I was like home for like four days. And I was like, oh, ugh. oh me and my parents' house. I was like, oh, I feel like shit. And then I was, I was actually dope sick. So from the age of like 19 to 27, I was shooting dope pretty much full time. When you, when you got dope sick the first time at your folks, did you rush out to get dope? Like when did, how did you get well? Like, how did you realize did, it, and, and how did you medicate it? I didn't really realize it at the at the moment. I just thought I was sick because I had never been dope sick before. I was like, something's not right. I couldn't sleep, legs, nauseous, you know, the, the whole nine. And then when I went back to where I was living, uh, I got dope right away. And I was like, oh, I feel good now. That's what it was. And then once I realized... That's where the monkey really jumped on my back because now I know what dope sick is and now I know what's going to fucking fixes it. And you don't want to be that, you know? No. Um, and uh, I love hearing about, uh, you know, like your hustles in order to, to keep getting heroin. But the thing that interests me, like with, with punk rock and heroin, you know, like Johnny Thunders or Iggy Pop or fucking, um, who am I thinking of? I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say. All these guys are like these punk rock junkie legends. How do you, like, is, does that cross your mind? You're in this punk rock band. You're a heroin addict. Does, does punk rock junkie shit no. enter your head at all or no? No, uh, no, no. Um, it, I, I wasn't like, Ooh, I'm living some Johnny thunders fucking lifestyle. Ooh, I'm fucking Keith Richards. Fuck. Yeah. Right, like, like, right, right. Like emulating these rock icons. No, I was just a kid that was way into punk rock, but, but had issues with drugs, you know? How did you tour as a junkie? Like where, how would you, how the, would you deal okay. with it? At the time. Okay. So we were a band. We got, we started when I was like 16, I think, you know, I didn't start doing dope until I was like 19. So let's say when I'm 20, 21 years old, we'd go on tour to, all the way to us where seven. Mike was in college for nine months of the year. So we wouldn't really play any shows. We might play a weekender here or a weekender there occasionally, but the band was just a hobby. You know, Melvin had a job, Mike was in college. You know, the band was just like, oh, okay, cool, something to do. So when, and then every summer, you know, Mike would say, or Melvin would say or whatever, hey, we're gonna pick you up, you know, June 28th at, you know, be at, be at this house or I'll, we'll pick you where, where you are. We're, we're going on, tour for the summer. We're just going to go do the United States. And I was, I would look forward to it. So I would just kick for the first week, just like lay in the back of the van and be fucking miserable and be like, feel like shit and drink a lot of fucking beer and play shows. You know, um, I would, I would cop occasionally, you know, because back then like, it wasn't really around. Like when you pull into fucking like, you know, Ashland, Oregon, population of fucking 17. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's so, so I would cop every now and again, but for the most part, it was just like, you know, okay, cool. I'll just kick. And then, and then I just drank like a fucking asshole for the whole summer. Then they would drop me off, you know, August 4th, wherever the fuck I wanted to be dropped off at. And I would just start it all over again until next year. Right. And that, and when does the more, the phenomenon of the moron twins start? Is that more on start, brothers? More on brothers. I when does think that start? That starts in 
87 or 88, we're in Baltimore and we and and we're staying at this fucking house because we we would go on tour. We would we'd roll into a town and we'd fucking like go to the lo local record store or or we would have a phone number for somebody and go, hey, we're in town. We're at this gas station. Set us up a party to play or or we'll play anywhere or can you put us up? Because it was more like we were just just trying to get from A to B to C to D all the way around the country. So we're in Baltimore and we ended up at this apartment where there's, I don't know, like five or six guys living. And they were all about our age, but then there was DJ, this like 16 year old little kid. But he was fucking funny, he was Riley, he was, he was just a spaz. And him and I instantly hit it off, instantly. So uh, when we were leaving Baltimore, he just hops in the fucking van with us. And now all of a sudden he's on tour with us. And he goes around the United States and ends up staying with, like living in California with me. So we became the Moron Brothers immediately. Immediately. And the Moron Brothers is like some kind, it's like basically untreated alcoholism on the road as a kid, fucking mayhem. Like, can you describe it to the Dopey Nation what being the Moron the Moron Brothers Okay, looks first like? off. The, the the word the Moron Brothers comes from that movie Splash. Yeah, I think he says the Moron Twins in Splash. That's why I had it okay. wrong in my Okay, head. yeah, we're yes. the Moron Brothers. Yeah. What we're do what we do is it's like, okay, we are just every night we would play or we wouldn't play, but our mission was is just to be mischievous, just to be like Dennis the Menace. So we would go to parties or wherever we were, we would just be doing stupid, fucked up, funny things, you know, like shit in people's sock drawers at people's houses and not and not telling them or or you know pissing in the ice trays or you know just you know putting putting rice in the car radiators in the neighborhood so when the car is heated up the rice explodes out yeah it, i think it's a little past mischievous i think it's like a couple clicks past mischievous i don't know what it but is but it wasn't it wasn't <laughs> Uh, it, it wasn't, wasn't terrorism. It wasn't flat it wasn't out malicious. terrorism. It wasn't like out of, it was just being fucking like, uh, pranksters, you know? Yes. Yes. Fucking doing dickish things, but it wasn't out of just complete dick, like assholeness. It was just having fun at other people's expenses. Yes. Imagine dude, imagine you go to your car to start the car and it explodes with rice at this point. Oh well, you got to drive down the road for the water to get hot. Then it expands. Have you ever been around somebody who had a, a rice engine that you had done that to? No, you never saw what you never <laughs> you never saw like what it looked like. The the one of my favorite stories is the story where you're like on the road and and there's an art student who somehow her her fucking medium is food. Can you explain this to me? She was an art student. It was her fucking final to graduate college and the professor was taking it easy on them. And it was just like, look, just bring in some food that looks like, like make something out of food. I don't care what it is. Just bring something in, you know? And so we show up at her house. We go to a party. I mean, we play a show. We show up at her house and I think this is in Illinois or something. And she's like, have fun guys. It's fucking rage. Just do good. Just do everything, but just stay away from, she had a pizza. I forget what it was. She had like a dog or something like that, and and Jello boobs. Stay away from those. I got they're my school project. I gotta fucking bring them in tomorrow. The second she said stay away from those, boing, lights go on, lights go on. So that night, me and DJ are fucking partying. She has a Vespa. We absolutely just destroy the Vespa, jumping it, knocking it over, spinning donuts, like fucking wreck the thing. When everybody's passed out, you know, it's fucking three in the morning. We're fucking hungry. There's pizza and jello. You know? So we fucking, we eat it. I don't remember if we ate it all or ate parts of it, but we ate it. And then that morning, like at seven or eight in the morning, when she woke up to go to fucking school, I woke up with her fucking foot on my head or on my neck or something like that with scissors in her hands, starting to chop off my luscious dreadlocks. Wow. She was fucking pissed. No, she was not, not, she was, it was, I'm sure she wasn't thinking, oh, Dennis the Menace with his slingshot. I'm sure she fucking wanted to kill you. Um, and my favorite story for some reason is you're in the bathroom, uh, pissing in the toilet and a cat walks over and you piss on the cat. I don't know why I like that story. Maybe I hate my cat. Um, but, uh, now as a junkie, as a using junkie who you, you kick and then you fucking go full bore on the road you know, alcoholically or whatever, when you come back, like how does 
every time you come back, are you like dying to have the first shot? Like, how does that oh, work? I'm stoked. Like, 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 you know, like, yeah, I'm looking forward to coming back. I come back and the first thing I do is go to like my junkie buddies and, you know, fucking ask them to give me some fucking dope on credit. And then, and then, so they give me, you know, and then I'm off and running again, man. And then, and then there's, you know, there's a new chapter in my life for the next nine months, you know, and then for nine months I'm fucking becoming a junkie. And, and as I got older and older and older, uh, the struggle became more and more real and more and more hard. And, you but you know, were also making much more money from the band. No, we weren't making anything. There was you zero still, money. Being, it, you didn't make money till after you got clean from the band. Correct. Made okay. zero money until after, after we got clean. That's so that's why that I had hustles. In itself? That's interesting in itself. I think and like, it's weird. Well, yeah, here's, here's, I mean, jumping to the end of my using fat Mike and the guys give me an intervention. Actually, Mike does. It's like, you are going to be out of the band 100% unless you go to rehab and clean up. And at that point, this is like now when I'm 27, I couldn't be around my family anymore. I had burnt out all my bridges. I was homeless. No one wanted to be around me. And the band was the last piece of something solid in the real world that I had. The last piece of something that meant something to me. And without the band, I knew that I would have just died one of those homeless guys on a street corner or under a bridge because uh, it's just what I was. And so I go to rehab. I um, come out of rehab. How did that fucking work? Oh, oh. I that That's it. We went to Europe and we made money. We made money for the very, very, very first time. I made $10,000 after being in Europe for like three months. I come home and I immediately spend $5,000 on dope. Immediately. The band holds the intervention. I take the other half of the money and I go through rehab and I get clean and sober. And that, and I've been clean and sober ever since that time. And then from that point on, that is actually when the band broke. The second I got clean, the second I like changed my life, like, and I meant it with all sincerity between me and the fuck, me and God, not the Jesus Christ God, but my God. I'm with you. Um, my life went, I went from making nothing to like, oh my God, I'm in a successful band. Over fucking night, the second I got clean. It was so fucking weird. Before we get to that, because that's like ridiculously interesting, I want to know, first of all, why does Courtney Love say you're the worst junkie she ever, in history? Like, why does she say that? She didn't say it in the amount of drugs that I used or what I would do to get drugs. She said it in the way that um, I was always throwing up, no matter what. I, was, I mean, I probably threw up 30 fucking times a day. When I was dope sick, all I would do was fucking throw up, <gasps> you know, because I'm sick. When I caught the dope, it would trigger something in my head. And I was just continually throwing up. When I was trying to, when I was cooking it up and stuff like that, always just, <clears throat> if, I mean, you ever experienced that? Yes. Yeah, so I was constantly throwing up and just a fucking mess. I was 127 pounds, constantly throwing up, dirty, just gross. I was a gross I would fucking throw up. I, I would throw up when I first did dope and I wasn't used to it. I would throw up then. I would throw up high. Like I remember I would I would drive down the street. I would open the door and just vomit yeah. out the door as I was going. And I, I would throw up in, in withdrawal in the beginning of being sick. But, like, the other night, we get Chinese food around here, right? We get this Thai Chinese food where I live. And I live in uh, Long Island, New York. And it's not the greatest Thai Chinese food. But um, wait, I get General Tso's chicken that I split with my daughter. And I'm putting it on her plate and my plate. And I get this smell. And I'm uh. like, what the fuck does that smell like? And I was like, holy shit, it kind of smells like dope. It was like some... The trigger. Could, I couldn't place it and I didn't throw up. It was like this weird smell that was wrong, right? But it hit that piece in my brain where I was like, what the fuck? I know what that's I know that smell. And I wonder 
what the connection between the general toes and heroin and was it a tar smell or was it a powder smell? I couldn't remember because I, I got high yeah. on the East Coast and the West. Like, I, I'm from New York, but I wound up living in L.A. for years and I, I had a bad problem in both places, but I couldn't connect the smell. I didn't throw yeah. up into the Chinese food, but I... Yeah, I, you know, I, I have the same thing. When You know, the tar out here has that sweet odor. It's the tar. Yeah, like just, just thinking about it right now just makes me fucking yeah. I like I walk down the street and I catch a whiff of something like that. I'm just like, oh, ooh, it's a fucking trigger, man. It's a trigger. So so Courtney Love just said I'm the worst junkie she's ever seen just because of the way that I held myself. How romantic you know? was the relationship with her? Uh, I wasn't romantic. It was just like we were friends. You know, we were we were friends, and then you know we we fucking had sex. You know, we were just a couple junkies. The other thing that the, one of my favorite stories is your book fucking stealing stories, because like I lived in public housing and like they would throw shit in the garbage room. Like we had like old people lived where I grew up and like for some, like maybe people died and good books went into the garbage room and you could take a big art book. I remember I was sick and I found two books on Japanese art that were like that. And I took them to Barnes and Nobles and I got 50 bucks and I was shocked. And, um, <laughs> So when I heard your 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 heists, uh, it brought me back. But the tell the story about like uh, the bust, the book stealing bust oh. with the me I'm and like, DJ. Yeah, yeah. All right. So so I had a car at the time. Okay. What we did is we would we would we had this fucking dude that would pimp out all of these fucking young junkie kids. Me being myself, this older guy, and he would buy books off of us for 20% of the cover price. And he would say, okay, this week I need architecture books, art books, and fashion books. And he would go take them and sell them at book fairs and swap meets, you know, like high-end books. And he would sell them at, at discounted prices. He would tell us what he wanted. And he had a whole fucking ring of probably like nine or 10 of us. You know, everybody's in early 20s that would go steal books all day for the hustle. And we're all junkies. So we pull up to this bookstore in the valley that we where we knew we could get I don't know a, a book on fucking you know origami or whatever the fuck it was, uh -huh. and I had the car. So since I had the car, I was the driver at this point. And there's a gas station on the corner, and the gas station shares the wall with the bookstore. So I pull in to pump up the gas while DJ goes in to uh, to steal the books. So I'm pumping up the gas. I get them pumping up, put the pump away, and I'm just pull over to the side, and I'm waiting for DJ to come out. And then, I don't know, three minutes later, five minutes later, what, 10 minutes later, I don't know, DJ comes running out sprinting, and he has these two dudes in tow, and he's obviously busted. They fucking busted him. They tackle him, and I'm sitting there 40 feet away from him. We look exactly the same. We both have fucking dreadlocks. We're both probably wearing dog patch wino vests. You know, just fucking like it's obvious that I'm part of the fucking part of the caper. And these guys tackle DJ. They're fucking holding them down. And I'm like, I got to get the fuck out of here because I got a car full of stolen books. I have other books in there from other bookstores. And I go to the car and the fucking lock. I lock the goddamn keys in the car. I lock the fucking keys in the car. These guys have fucking DJ. The yeah. cops are fucking coming. And I'm 40 feet away with two thousand dollars of stolen books. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm scared to death. I run, run down this alley that's behind it. Run and I go fucking hide for a couple hours. Then I, uh, I hide. I see them. I, I could see them take DJ away. They don't notice the car, but I come back and I had to go to a uh, a tailor. You know where they are, steam cleaner place. And I got the little coat hanger to unlock the car. But Dry I mean, like, cleaner. what a fucking idiot! I'm driving the getaway car and I lock the keys in the car. I'm impressed that you could open the door with a fucking coat hanger. I find that to be very impressive. You never did that before? I'm from Manhattan. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to do anything with cars. Like, I don't it's know. fucking I don't. easy. You, you slide it through the window, and you roll it down to the lock, and you go, boop, and you pop, pop it easy. Now, um, I think it's incredible that the band makes it after you get sober. Like, how how connected do you think that is? 150%. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to put it on me. Like, it's because I got sober. Mike's songwriting was getting better and better and better. Our genre of music was starting to pick up steam, like our style of punk rock. We were on a really good label. 
I think it's all like uh, timing, luck, serendipity, you know, like. Um, Which is also can be seen as God's will if you want. Right. Yeah. You could, that, yeah. that is, I mean, for me, half the time that's God's will timing, serendipity, fucking luck, whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a hell of a goddamn coincidence. I mean, literally the second I get sober, the man fucking goes from playing in front of 60 people a night to 600 a night, you know? And, um, I'm really fucking thankful. It's, it's a, it's a weird fucking story. It's, I, I can't wrap my head around it, but, but the timing of it was just fucking amazing. Absolutely amazing. As this rough and tumble punk rock guy who was drawn to violence, chaos, unpredictability, how how did 12 Steps suit you so well? Like, how, how easy was it to do 12 Steps? Was it weird? Did it feel uncomfortable? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because I was so broken inside. I was so longing to get better. For the last four years of doing, of doing the heroin, it's not who I wanted to be. It's not where I wanted to be at night. When I would close my eyes, my heart would be saying, this isn't you. You're better than this. This isn't, I just didn't know how to get out of it. You know, like when you're stuck in addiction, you you feel like it's the loneliest place in the world and no one understands you're alone on your little island of, of pain and uncomfortability and, you know, your self imprisonment. And once I surrendered to the fact that like, I need to change my life that I go to this fucking rehab and I promised myself that the second I went in there, like I had never followed through with anything in my life. I promised myself every single second that I'm in there, I'm going to give it 140%. Because if I get high the second I walk out, at least I give it an honest effort. So for me to sit in there and shut my mouth, not rationalize, listen to what the people have to say, take it all in, um, it worked. It worked Change. because I was... I Please keep going. I was, I was so broken inside that I, I quickly realized I don't know shit about living as a, a, a normal person, you know? Total, I, I, I understand. I've been doing this show for like over six years. I talked to, you know, every week is another person like us with a story. I don't think, I can't remember anybody who actually got clean from their first time in treatment. Like, how often do you hear that? You know. You know, I, I had done, I had been on methadone maintenance for years and I, you Me know, too. all that shit, right? But I was so broken. I was so fucking broken. Like, I remember, okay, this is probably about six months before I went to rehab, maybe. No, no, it was probably two years, two years. Um, you know, I, I would go to meetings occasionally, just like get my parents off my back or this or that or whatever it may be. Uh, I went to a meeting and for some reason when I walk, walk in, I just started sobbing because I knew that there was help and I knew that I was a broken person, but I didn't know how to get out of it. And so they did the newcomer thing and I went up there and, and, I, and I realized my life was completely out of control. And I was like sobbing up at the podium, just saying, hey, I'm Eric, I'm new, you know? It didn't last, I never went back to that meeting, but I just knew in my heart that I was done. Absolutely. And, you knew, and you knew there was a solution and you felt like you belong there, like, which is incredible. I mean, like to get there the first time also, like you had put yourself through the fucking ringer long enough, you know, you didn't need to do it again. It's, we no. all get there when we're ready to get there. And, and you know what I mean? Like I, I, nothing else. To and say the one thing, really. the one thing, I don't know, the one thing I did and, 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 and when I talk to people that are trying to get their shit together now, I tell them to just, you got two ears and one mouth. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. If you have something really valid to say or a question or something going on, go ahead. But don't go in there with like, sit on your fucking high horse and this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm, or, or rationalize behavior or say this isn't for me or all that kind of shit, because it is, you know? And, and just sit down, shut up, listen. It's as hard as you make it on yourself. If you, just listen and follow what those people say. It's a good roadway to getting healthy. Totally. I mean, and in Long Island, AA is always like the rule of AA in Long Island, New York is you keep your fucking mouth shut. You know what I mean? Like you don't fight. Like I don't like when I fight with my wife, I know that I'm not practicing a good program. I know that like I should just shut the fuck up and let it happen. Cause if I'm just yeah. going to be the thing that gets in the way, let me ask you this. What happens to the Moron Brothers when you get sober? 
Okay, so me and DJ had been running around together for, I don't know, four years at this, but, uh, you know, he, he went his way. Okay, he ripped off a bunch of, our, a bunch of our friends, and he got chased out of town. He started doing the prison thing, you know, going in for 18 months, coming out, violating, going in for 18 months, you know, doing that fucking circle. Um, what happened? We lose, we, lose, we lose touch on each other. I get a letter from myself, I don't know, a year after I get sober. I get a letter from myself from prison. It's Eric DJ. Sandin is, sends yes. you a letter and it's DJ in jail using your name. Right, yeah, he got sentenced to a couple years for like uh, stealing your car or something like that, but he was under my name as an alias. So that's how we, we reconnected. And now DJ has 15 years clean and sober. Awesome. He's doing fucking great, a father of two, like doesn't have a tooth in his fucking face because he, 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 he went until he was 40. You know, I went until I was 27, you know, but... um. They were good. We're, he's fucking good. I'm so proud because I got him high for the first time, you know, and and he was 16 and I was like 21 or something. And and he went hard. He went hard quick, you know, and that 16 year old kid, man. It's too young. It's scary. It's scary. Yeah. And you must yeah. be so happy that he didn't die because you would have to fucking live with that horrible guilt. Right. Abs- I mean, I'm guilty. I feel guilt. Honestly, I feel guilt enough as it is because of, of it. But, um, yeah. They say resentment is the number one offender for us. How much resentment do you have for a band that gets to get high with impunity, especially in your early sobriety? <sighs> early sobriety, not so much because they were just drinking and stuff like that. You know, like Mike, in the last 20 years is when the drugs really started taking over. Um, I definitely have resentments, but I have resentments in the way he rationalizes things and says it's okay. And, you know, I see his life in complete chaos and everybody else does, but he's a master manipulator in the world, in the way of like being able to manipulate things, you know, and, and I see it for what it, what it is. Uh, and I have... I also feel pity because he's not facing his truths by the, by the, by the rationalization. I don't know if pity is the right word. I feel I see the truth concern. And, um, but at times like, you know, we'll be having a discussion. He'll, he, he will have acted like an asshole, a complete asshole because of drug, because he was on drugs and this and that. And he'll just make up some bullshit excuses, you know? And I'm like, and I get resentful, but then, you know, he's in the middle of it. He's in the middle of it. You know, it's, I mean, it's, as a reader, it, as a reader who's a drug addict in recovery, I'm so pissed. You know, you've been through the fucking ringer, and he's talking about his like, I need to to drink three drinks before the show and do my three valiums during the show and my line of coke before the encore. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm annoyed as a as a drug addict in recovery reader, like. Just it's annoying, you know what I mean? Like to see consequences like he's seen and then talk about it so casually. But isn't that just denial, right? That's denial probably. One hundred percent. And it's also it's like doing a geographical or or switching wine for beer or switching, you know, like what it says in the big books, how how I'm gonna not drink until Friday, you know, give myself a reward and all that kind of shit. Like he it's it's all and a lot of it is a smoke screen because if he thinks he has it under control, he's selling it to everybody else that he does have it under control. That's also just to protect it. You, it's like your precious thing that you don't want to lose. If you have it under control, no one's going to take it away from you. You don't have to face yourself. I mean, I've been in that situation before. And I have I'll so you, many I'll, friends. I'll tell you this. We did an intervention on him a year and a half ago, like a legitimate intervention because he was, he was out of control. Like go to rehab or the band is done. Basically what he did for me, but, but it was go to rehab or you're out of the band. For him, it was the go to rehab or the band is done. And we were all willing 100% to put our livelihood on the table. You know, we're not rich men. Yeah, I can't retire. And, and so, so it, there were some heavy consequences for us too, but we just couldn't live that way anymore. And he just met us with fucking fire and vinegar. You know what I mean? Like when he did the intervention with me, I, I, I love, thank you. I love you. I need, I need your help. But 
he just met us with the exact opposite, like like what you see on those fucking TV shows, you know? Right, right. And it was so fucking like I look back, it's like, how could you treat people that that are legitimately concerned for your life with such hostility? It was so weird. It's active addiction though, right? Yeah. You know, it's like you had total surrender because you were fucking done. He's not done. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he's like, he's like, don't take that away from me. I need it. You know, and it's like, I hear you. That's fucking. So how is he now? How do you deal with it now? Well, he went to rehab for a month or so, came out and he did 10 months sober, but he didn't do anything to stay sober. He didn't do anything. He didn't work any steps. He didn't have any, you know, no, no anything. He was just dry, but he right. was no, a much no spirit, no spiritual awakening. No, no. I mean, no, 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 nothing, you know. Um, uh, now he's halfway in between where he was and where we want him, you know. And you it's can't tough. turn on the light, but you can't turn on the light for somebody else. There's nothing no. you can do. No, no, not at all. I mean, I, I know that for a fact, you know. He, he's going to get there when he's going to get there. We, we, we did what we had to do, and, you know, it is what it is. Do you ever try to 12 step him and talk about a spiritual solution or, or like no. what, you know, you don't think that would be I, helpful. He, he does stuff like, he does stuff like, Hey, Smelly, come to Hawaii with me for a sober week. Let's go have a sober week. Let's be sober buddies. And, and like, let's be sober, 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 sober. And I'm like, no, no, that's just manipulative bullshit. That's you just, you know, no. But if you ever really want to get your shit together, I am here for you 100%, you know, and, and I will, you know, the day he got out of rehab, I went and hung out with him at his house. You know, it's, it's, but if, if we're still playing the fucking games, I'm not going to play into it. And I'm, you know, tell the story of, uh, of your daughter, of your, of your adopted daughter. Cause I think that that's really crazy story, beautiful story. And I think our audience will really relate to it. Okay, I was married to at a previous marriage, and her family is bottom of the barrel, living literally living under bridges and in tents, homeless tweakers. Pretty much everybody in her family is like that. My ex, only reason why she's not like that is because she was good looking, and somebody fucking took her out of that situation when she was younger, you know. And so. I don't know, like 15 years ago, no more than that, 17 years ago. Yeah, 17 years ago, her and I are married. We get a phone call from CPS, Child Protective Services, and they have her, my ex-wife's little cousin, this little girl named Joey in custody. Joey is seven years old. And uh, they say, you know, we took her away because, you know, you know, just drug addict shit, you know. And uh, um, she's either going into the foster system today or you you guys can claim her. And you have 12 hours. I think it was like 12 hours, maybe 24 hours to figure it out. Because if you come back in three days, she'll be in the system and it's not easy to, to, to get her out then. So it was a no-brainer. We got her. And she was seven years old, had, had grown up, never going to school living out of trash cans. Um, her mom would, was pulling tricks next to her, you know, living under bridges and shit. She moves in with us. Nice house, goes to a nice school, all that kind of shit. And uh, my dad grew up in a similar similar fashion to her. He was, he was orphaned and um, bounced around from family, family member to family member. So they have a very strong connection, my dad and my daughter. And then that actually started healing me and my dad's differences. So she moves. So, so my daughter moves in with me, with us. And, um, I don't know, man, I just fucking fall in love with this little fucking girl. She becomes my fucking baby. She, How I'm much sober time? How much sober time did you have when you guys adopted her? Uh, 2004, 96, nine years. No, let me see. I'm at 29 now and 17, so eight years, something like I mean, that. That's a decent. It's a decent chunk of time, but it's still balls to be a punk rock drummer and be like, "I'm ready to adopt somebody," right? Yeah. And adopt a adopt a kid that had never grown up in any fucking kind of um, loving environment and all that kind of stuff. And 
her and I just fucking bonded together. And all of a sudden now I get this fucking, this beautiful little soul in my life that I get to take care of, you know, for good, bad, and indifferent. But I mean, I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to be a father. I've always had that like infinity to, to, to love, to, to, to love another, you know? And uh, this little girl, man, is just fucking humbling. It was, it was uh, life changing, and it gave me purpose. It gave me purpose other than just being a fucking guy going on the road, and you know, me, me, me. You know, it was just like yeah. all of a sudden, nothing, nothing was about me. Here's a picture of her and I from like, I don't know, tw- twelve years ago. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing because you also write about how it, how it like it was the greatest change for your family to bring her into it. Like it it affected the most change with your folks and, and your relationship with your dad. Like, I think it was super healing. It was super fucking healing. I mean, like my dad, my dad's never said, I love you to me. He's never said, I love you to anybody. I think honestly, like my wife was just on the, on the phone with him an hour ago and she said, I love you pops. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He can't say it, but to, and, and he never treated me with love. He only treated me with anger you know, abuse, alcohol, with active alcoholism, what goes along with that. And now he's sober and he still can't say I love you or any of that shit. But to see the way he connected with my daughter really healed a lot of my resentments because he was just doing the best he could too. And and it also gave him a chance to be a good parent figure. Well, you could see him, you could see him like this person that basically oppressed you and like abused you in some sort of capacity, you could see him in this innocent girl, which changes the perspective. Yeah. And I could see him giving the love, like he had grown into knowing how to learning how to give the love that he should have given me and just seeing him be able to give it to her. It really helped me. There was no jealousy, no resentment. It was just fucking nice. It's amazing. I love, did fat Mike annoy your dad? Dude, Fat Mike annoyed my dad just last weekend. Enough to where my dad called me up and said, what the fuck is that guy's deal? What did he do? Okay, you know the book, right? The book doesn't have a whole lot of flattering things to say about my dad. You know, except for the very end. It comes around. The end is very beautiful about your dad. Right. But I mean, I'm just telling my story as my childhood. and, and, And he was just doing the best he can. And I wasn't trying to paint him in a bad light. I was just telling my my truths, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my mom read the book and she's like, my dad is a big stoic fucking tough guy, but that's because he's a soft, insecure, sensitive guy on the inside. Like you know, alcoholics that's, that's usually really, are. Right. You're right. He's very sensitive. You can see that's why I can't say I love you because it's just hard for him. Like, you know, so um, it's hard for him to face emotion. So my mom read the book and said, dude, this book is going to kill your fucking dad because he's only going to see the negative. He won't see the positive, right? He's, he's, he's not a very optimistic person. And, um, and I take it back. He's a very optimistic person, but he, but he's very hard on himself. Uh, I understand so, what you mean. yeah, my dad and I had a conversation and my, my mom and my dad had a conversation like, look, it's just best that you don't read it. It's all good. We're in a good spot right now. It's all good. The guys in the band know that. Everybody fucking knows that. Everybody fucking knows that. So we play last weekend. My dad goes to the show. Mike corners my dad. And he's like, dude, have you read the book yet? Have you read the book yet? Fuck, come on, dude. I know that you, I know that Smelly doesn't want you to, but you should read the fucking book, dude. He says, I love you in it. Oh, boy. He really, you know, he was blah, blah, blah. And just started fucking elaborating on it. And like cornering, like when Mike, Mike holds you hostage in conversations. And my dad called me up Monday. He's like, what the fuck? I don't want to read the book. Why is this fucking guy trying to get me to fucking read the book? Now I'm that now curiosity has me want to. Now look he has at it. to read the book. Mike right. challenged and, him and, too much. You, you know what I mean? It's like one of those things. Like you know, don't eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. And finally, you you know, I'm gonna eat the cake. So I didn't do it, but I was gonna call up Mike and go, dude. I know it was all coming out of a good space, but stay the fuck out of my family's fucking dynamics. You know, we're. I I know you were trying to like be fucking helpful. But me and my dad are in a good spot right now, and he does not need to be fucking hurt. Right, right. You do not but, need him reading the book. You don't want him. Right. To read, I don't think he needs to read the book. I didn't. I did. I actually didn't. I was. I was. I was mad. I was this close to doing that. I was like, I'm gonna wait till I'm in person and just go like, Hey, bud, just 
stay off the book shit with my dad, you know? But you, you did what you said. You kept your mouth shut. You, 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 you held your tongue. Restraint of pen and tongue. That's good. Dude, reaction or reacting is the worst thing that anybody can fucking do because you're going to come off in, in the wrong way. Angry. And then you're just opening the door for them to come back at you. And then you got to come back at them. And it just opens up this fucking mess. Especially for people in recovery, because we're not like we have ceased fighting. Fighting in that situation is like it's poison. It's not going to do you any good. You can't win because if you win, you lose. Surrender is so much easier, even if you know the other person, even if you know the other person is wrong. It's so much easier to go, whatever. Right. And what? Give it no fucking fuel. Give it no fire. Yeah, sometimes it hurts to swallow your pride, you know, but pride's not going to get you anywhere in the long run. Here's a weird question about pride, right? In the book, you talk about, the band talks about the phenomenon of punk rock in the late 90s and the, the 2000s and how big it got and how much money it generated and how you guys, you know, stayed independent, stayed true to your roots. Um, and I think Melvin tells a story about resenting Blink-182, which I got a kick out of. Um, and then he said that Blink-182 offered you guys a million bucks to open for them. And, and Melvin's like, we didn't do it because we had pride. Is that is that the truth? Uh, I don't know about that million bucks. I remember seeing Blink-182 in, in their heyday, and they were using pretty much our jokes, you know, our right. shtick. Right. And I was like, motherfuckers, but they're fucking cool guys. You know what I mean? We influenced them in the humor sense, so whatever. You know, Bad Religion influenced us in the music sense. So there's... You know, there's nothing really original. Um, I don't know about the million bucks, but I know that they were offering, we were offered to go on tour with them. And we were like, we're fucking 15 years older than those guys. They have a bunch of 16 year old girls out there. They're gonna, the girls are going to be looking at us like, what are what are our dads doing on stage? You know, they want to sound like Blink 182. Right. And so we said, no, we said, no, just because it's, it's more risk than worth the reward. You know, like it's going to piss off our loyal fans. It's not good for us because what do we get out of it? And so Bad Religion did it instead, and it didn't work that well for them. No, it didn't work good for them. That's funny. Well, I mean, you know, they played, they got some good money for the shows, but they're not playing for their crowd. They didn't really earn any more crowds, you know, from it. You know, they're they're playing to a bunch of teeny boppers. What's your take on the phenomenon of of the explosion of punk rock as this pop phenomenon, like in in the late 90s? Like Machine Gun Kelly putting out a pop punk record or, or this Will Smith daughter pop punk business. Like, what's your take on all that shit? I don't give a shit. You know, Perfect. I mean, everything is so fucking watered down these days. Everything is so, you know, it's, I'm not going to give a shit. And for the most part, most music fucking sucks. And and that's just my opinion because it's it's not authentic. It's not. It's not um, natural. It's not organic. It's, it's, there's writers, there's this, there's that. It's just a big, I mean, it's always been a machine to make money, but it's worse than it ever was. And I think the Foo Fighters right now is the only band that is, is, is an authentic, in your face rock and roll band. You know, just can a couple they, can guitars. They, can they keep going without Taylor Hawkins? I don't think they will. You think it's done? No, man, that's a tough one, man. That's a fucking tough one. That's a real tough one. You know, because Taylor was almost just as much of a face as Dave Grohl. They're super tight, you know, and every night, I mean, they might keep going, but maybe it'll be in a few years, but then every night might be a reminder of, of what's not there. Right. No, of course. I mean, that's that's the deal with, uh, I mean, like, I don't. I didn't tell you the story of Dopey. But the story of Dopey was that I started it with a drug addict friend of mine who I met in rehab. And um, it was just about the dumbest shit we had done while we were using. You know what I mean? We started it. I had four months clean when we started it. My friend Chris had two years. He wound up relapsing while we were making the show. And he overdosed and he died like while we were making the show. And, um, and making the show was like that for a long time. That this guy who was always there isn't there anymore, you know? And, um, but, but I mean, like how many bands lose people and they figure out a way to keep going because they, they have to, you know what I mean? Like Dave Grohl, I can't see, I mean, what do you, what happens if Dave Grohl says, uh, 
I, I want you to come in and, and drum with the Foo Fighters. Fuck, dude, I would take it in a fucking heartbeat. <laughs> but, right. you, you know, I would uh, – They're fine. here's a little something. I was in a bad drummer's block a couple years ago, and I couldn't drum for shit. I was having a hard time just playing drums. It was full mental block. I'd put on Foo Fighter records and just play to them, and it, and it got me out of my funk. But uh, I, I think music is in Dave's blood, and I think music is Dave's life. He might do something else. I just don't, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, I know him, but I don't know him well enough to know what's going on, you know? Right. The Foo Fighters was him and then it was him and Taylor. Right. right. So, right. yeah, it's, and, 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 and what do you think? I mean, like the worst thing as a drug addict is to see, I, I don't know Taylor Hawkins. Like, I don't know his story particularly well. I just know that he, you know, he did a bunch of dope and he was in a coma in 2000 or something is what I read. And they found drugs in his system when he died um which is just hard I, I think as an addict in the world and he's such a fucking shining light of goodness the fact that there was drugs there it, it i don't know why it was painful for me as an addict maybe because i lost my friend and you want everyone to find recovery you know if fat mike turned up dead because he refused to find a spiritual solution it'd be fucking depressing you know what i mean well you know what the tra travesty is is it's such an unnecessary death. It does not have to happen. It's not like you get leukemia or in a car wreck or something like that. It's you're fucking around and you're playing Russian roulette and it is so fucking avoidable, you know, and it's, and people think drugs are recreational and all this kind of shit. Well, you know, is, is fucking taking your life in your hands recreational, you know, like it's, it's, it's so avoidable. That is that is the serious tragedy of it all to me, you know, because I've been there. I've overdosed. I've seen people die and all this kind of stuff. And it was like five minutes earlier, I'm walking down the street like everything's fucking hunky dory. Right. You know? But also when you're using, you don't think that you can die. Like it's not on the menu. Death isn't on the menu with getting high in the back of your head. Maybe it is, you know, like no, I remember. It I, it, what but, you but now that that's why it's probably so hard. Like when, when, when people, I know OD, like Taylor or whatever, like how it hit you is because you know that it didn't have to fucking happen. Right. Right. It was so avoidable, so fucking avoidable. Right. And to be on the other side of addiction, to be like right. you're in such long-term recovery, it's like, it's not on the table, which is probably why Mike is so frustrating. You know what I mean? Like. I'm I'm hoping like like what's up with no effects like what's happens now COVID's done what are you guys doing? We're playing shows. We're going to Europe next month, you know, and we've we've played like three or four shows in the last month or so. Just slowly starting to kind of get the get back on that horse. What about Melvin and Hefe? Like Melvin was getting into coke, and Hefe seems really chill. Uh, does, uh, they're, both, they're both. They're not fucking with it. Well. I'm excited. If you come to New York, please, uh, I would love to see you, meet you. It would be cool. Um, and I appreciate you spending all this time. Like, I know it's like uh, it starts one place and then it goes a while and we get to another place. But I do appreciate you uh, planting the uh, the flag. You know what I'm saying? Like, you had to do oh, it. Dude. Like, so, so many listeners are like, you got to get smelly from no effects. You got to get smelly from no effects. And then, like, I, I was, I didn't know. And then I read this book and I was like, I got to get smelly from no effects. <laughs> uh, but let me ask you this, to have this nickname, this punk rock nickname. I know I, you could tell the story. I like the story, but like, did you need a nickname? Like, why would, why did you guys need the nicknames? I don't know. These kind of fell into play. Well, Melvin's last name's Melvin. So that's right. just a Nick, you know I mean? It's, we're just Nick in the first part of his name. Um, El Jefe, because Mike's wife, El Jefe's real name is Aaron. Mike's wife's name, his ex-wife, was Aaron. So we're like, fuck, can't can't be the same name. So we started calling him the boss, you know. And Fat Mike, this, Fat Mike went away to college, probably 130 pounds. And after the first semester, he came back like 170 because he had like that that dorm card where you could eat as much as you want. So he became Fat Mike and smelly just because I was a stinky little fucking asshole, you know. You don't want to tell your story about 
eating like get what what was the story where you got uh okay. what was the I thing? gotcha I gotcha you don't have to here we go. I, I feel like we deprive the dopey nation we don't want to do that all right here we go this is this is how I got the name it's coming home from tour in I don't know 19 88 89 somewhere in there and I was living with a girl but on the road I happened to have picked up a venereal disease called chlamydia yeah from another girl or girls so coming home from tour with a venereal disease from other women isn't the best idea for a healthy relationship. And I knew from having chlamydia in the past that if you, they, they prescribed you tetracycline, you know, it's an antibiotic, I, I'm pretty sure. And uh, you eat t- tetracycline, it clears it out, you're all fucking good. And uh, I had, when I was younger, I had fish tanks. And when fish tanks get sick, like the water gets parasites or all, or, or, infections and shit like that you drop tetracycline into the fish tank and it clears it up so i was like fuck that i'm not going to go to the clinic i'm just going to go to the fish store and i went to the fish store and i bought a bunch of tetracycline and at the time i was shooting dope drinking beer taking a lot of acid being a fucking stinky little fucker eating the tetracycline and all of the other stuff in my system and being a stinky fucker in general leads to some fucking hellacious fucking farts like ridiculous we're all there's like six of us in a van and even just a little boop, just a little fucking tutor is fucking goddamn chemical warfare so i remember like they were just fuck dude stop it fuck just yelling at me call me mold fart call me all kinds of shit and then from that point on smelly just stuck well smelly is a funny word now tetracycline i can imagine fucks up the smell of your uh, of your farts and 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 being sick you know the farts are terrible but do you really think the acid played a role because it seemed like in what I've read and heard you talk about there's a lot of talk about acid affecting the smell of your fart do you really think acid played a role I mean it definitely didn't help I mean it's not like I'm drinking <laughs> some breeze you right, know I'm putting right. some weird chemicals in my system Right. Would you ever take ayahuasca or microdose psilocybin or any of this shit? I've thought about that, but I got to, I got to put a no on it because is the risk worth the reward? You know, I I have, I have drug, I'm a drug addict. I always, I'm still the same fucking person. And would I... (sighs) Would I be really taking it to find out what my inner soul is, or would it, or is it just a nifty to excuse get to get fucking to get wasted? Right, right, right. right. I'm in the same exact spot. I, I can't. But don't I, get me wrong. I've, I've thought about it, and then I was like snowboarding with somebody recently, and he's like, "Hey, dude, you want a microdose? I got these candy bars. It has a little bit of mushrooms in it. You can't even feel it, but you just, you just." And I'm like, "No, what? but but I mean, <laughs> it's it's there, but it's not there. But I'm never gonna do it." Well, it's like you might want to do it, but it's like risk reward, a hundred percent. And it's like also one of my favorite things you write in this book is that the chapter about how being a junkie kind of never leaves you. Like you have this sense, and um, I'm shocked that I still have it. Like I am fucking shocked that I can walk down the street, get it. I mean, like I, I I was walking someplace. And I got the sense that it was like it was on a Ninth Avenue in Manhattan, a spot that's never fucking dope spot. And I'm like, but now it is. Well, there's people there that don't, and they're not like fucking junkies. They're working people. But I got they're just there's there's like hanging out a little too much. And I talked about it on the show, and a listener was like, I went to the spot and copped. Next time, don't mention that. But like. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, and I was, I was impressed with myself that I still had the radar, but do you, you still feel do. it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like just the other day I was driving down the street. I live in Long Beach, you know, I was just driving down the street the other day and I'm like, oh, there's four guys kind of huddled up in this corner over there by a fucking 7-Eleven. Yeah. They're dealing. You know what I mean? And it's just like, you just know there's a laundromat a couple miles away and you drive by it at 11 o'clock at night and there's always five or six guys just standing in the parking Stop. lot. You know, you just fucking know. Once you've walked those fucking roads, you know that smell, you know that taste, you know that fucking body language. It's yeah. there. You don't never fucking leave you. Are you friendly I, with Mike Mike Mart? Yeah. Yeah, he I'm friends with Mike Mart. That's cool. I yeah. love Mike Mart. All right, cool. Nice. Yeah, he's a good guy. He, he, yeah, I mean I've, I've I did one I did a podcast. He he engineered it. I used to practice at his uh recording studio. He's like, when I asked you to record on your phone, that's what I call the Mike Mart method. 
He's, How do you know Mike? I know Mark, Mike from Dopey. Like uh, I know him through Bob Forrest, and me and him became friends through Dopey. Like uh, gotcha. I call him every, every like often. I, I love Mike more. I love Mike. Yeah. Mark. I don't um, know him extremely well, but I know him like enough. Hey, Mike, hey, Eric, what's happening? Good to see you. All right, cool, you know? But, I mean, yeah. yeah. He's a good dude. You you have Mike Mart vibes, and you live in Long Beach, so I was like, you probably know. Yeah. And he's punk. He's punk to the core, Tex and the horse yeah. heads and all that. Yeah. I've, um, I've, yeah, I've, no, I've known Mike for quite a long time, and we're not best friends, but we're, but we're definitely good acquaintances. All right, you want to play a quick game before we're done? Sure. You just pick. I'm going to say two things. You pick. Uh, heroin or fentanyl? <sighs> heroin. Sting or Slash? Sting. New York Dolls or the Ramones? Ramones. Dog Patch Winos or FFF? Oh, Winos all the way. Fuck those assholes. Chris Rock or Will Smith? Chris. El Duce or Gigi Allen? <laughs> well, well, that's a tough one because I was friends with El Duce, but I got a good story with Gigi Allen. I'm going with El. Me and El were friends. Okay. Operation Ivy or The Descendants? neither okay black flag or the rollins band black flag come on i'm just asking tom petty or prince tom petty blink 182 or avril levine <laughs> avril levine <laughs> billy joe or billy joel joe <laughs> billy joel got <laughs> uh the specials or the english beat specials keith richards or johnny thunders well, Johnny Thunders was in fucking uh, New York Dolls. Yeah. Uh, and the Keith uh, Richards and the Stones. Yeah, I'm going to go with Keith Richards. Machine Gun Kelly or Willow Smith? I don't even know any of their songs, so I'll go Willow Smith. She's a cute little bisexual girl. There you go. Travis Barker or Gene Krupa? Gene Krupa. Travis Barker, Jax. Put your fucking shirt on. Sit down. Courtney Love or Fat Mike? <laughs> Courtney. Courtney. <laughs> All right. This is a good game. I thank you very much. Fucking yeah. awesome. Um all right. Dude, thank you very 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 much. My pleasure. If you ever need anything from me, please hit me up. Do not hesitate. And if we're ever in the Long Island area, you hit me up. I'll get I'll get you in. Please or Manhattan. I'll, I'll fucking buy you a sandwich. I work, I, yeah, I, I I will look you up and I will find you and I promise you I will annoy you in New York. Do they call it the tri-state region? Is that what it is? They call it the tri-state area. Yeah, same fucking bullshit. Just come to New York and I'll see you. It's great to meet you. I appreciate you we will, so we, much time. We will actually be there probably sooner than later. All right, let us know. Let me, I'll, I'll find you right on, Eric. Thank All you. right. All right, bud. Cool, man. Thank you for, thank you for letting me uh, participate. Dude, it was awesome. I appreciate it. Will be, I'm on the floor. Will be, I have some more.